So we're late. Um, we were running behind a little bit with a patient. I do like to hear that everybody had a baby. And that means that we're a little bit behind on other things that we had scheduled. So I apologize for that. Today, Sarah and I are here talking about winter mood changes. Um, mood changes in general could be a topic that people would want to discuss. So if you have interest in mood changes generally in the future or mood changes in association with a life event or with anything else that might be going on, um, we can certainly do a separate Facebook Live on that. But this Facebook Live today is about mood changes that women experience in the winter time. Winter time. So tell me, Morgan, what are some mood changes that women might experience around this winter time and maybe what types of seasonal changes might kind of affect those mood changes or bring them on yeah so um in the winter time if you live in florida this actually doesn't really apply to you because well some of it does because some of it is cultural and some of it is biological um if you live in a place like the pacific northwest that is gray and dreary and doesn't have a lot of sunshine then we get a change in our circadian rhythms we feel much more tired and groggy it's hard for us to get out of bed we feel much less rejuvenated and much less like going to work you know, we're much less likely to turn on the radio and roll down the window and feel really gung-ho about the things that we're doing yeah <laughs> um and some of that is just what happens inside of our pituitary glands and inside of our hypothalamus with the release of the brain chemicals that cause us to feel peppier and for some people this change is so severe that it can actually cause a depression and it's a chemical depression it is not a depression caused by the situations of their lives or by particular stressors although stressors will predispose us to potentially having worse moods um, it's just something that happens so for a lot of women who experience what's called seasonal affective disorder a disorder being something that's disrupting their lives right like not a problem with the person but something that's causing a problem with them functioning normally in their lives yeah and I like to differentiate that because I don't want a person to feel disordered because they have something that's different about them or they feel sad in the winter it only becomes a disorder when it becomes really disruptive in their lives um, so if somebody were to experience that depression that is strictly a chemical depression it typically resolves when the sun comes back <laughs> ironic <laughs> so what like we have you know i'm on the other side of the spectrum where the rain makes me like insanely happy so is the sun mm -hmm. um so what are some types of feelings that women might be experiencing? I know you said tired or feelings of depression. What are some other ways that this can kind of manifest itself to where maybe they don't realize that that's what's happening or that there's a way to kind of treat it so that it's not happening? Yeah, so often it's that uh, tiredness or feeling like you can't really get anything done, which then creates excuse me, feelings of guilt and often anxiety, especially around Christmas. Like I've got to get all of this stuff done and there's so many demands and I have to make cookies and I send out Christmas cards and I have to clean up the kids' messes because I've got company coming over and I have to get ready for the holiday party. Like there's so many demands on women around the holiday season that um, feeling tired makes it really hard to get those done and that can generate anxiety. So they may not even really be aware of how tired they're feeling or how kind of sluggish or lethargic they're feeling they may be more aware of the anxiety that that's generating because it's making it harder for them to accomplish the tasks that they're hoping to accomplish and because they've had a huge number of tasks that they don't ordinarily have to navigate loaded on their plates because of all of the holiday cheer mm -hmm. that comes with the holiday season and it is cheerful but it's also very demanding particularly on women who end up hosting a lot of things and playing santa mm -hmm. and have a lot of roles that they have to fulfill and expectations of themselves and that others have of them during that holiday period and so often it would just be the anxiety that they feel like they can't get it done they've got to get it done and they feel pressured to get it done and then yes there can be feelings of depression but they tend to be insidious so they tend to be like they just feeling a little down and not mm -hmm. really knowing why you feel down not feeling like catatonically depressed where you're like I'm depressed and want to jump off the bridge although 
could get there I mean, it could become that um, but usually it's more of kind of like this slow like onset of feeling just kind of like I don't really want to do anything I'm not really that interested in anything there's something called anhedonia that happens which is where you just don't get pleasure out of any of the things that you used to enjoy doing so if you used to enjoy going to the gym and in the winter suddenly you're like I can't mm -hmm. some of that is actually just the chemical response to it being dark out and not having exposure to sunlight mm -hmm. and it could be on a spectrum it could be a manifestation of some degree of seasonal affective disorder like it's not you being lazy because it's mm -hmm. winter time it's actually chemically what happens it's the hibernation of our brains yeah. and our society doesn't allow us to stop doing all right. the things that we do the rest of the year yeah. once it becomes gray and dreary in washington so you mentioned you know seasonal affective disorder it happens during the season and particularly in the Pacific Northwest because it is gloomy and rainy and not much sun so what how does that like affect a person just because there's no sun like what does that do to them internally to kind of push people to feel yeah. sad and yeah so um, I think that we think that sun is a bad thing because I, I mean it gives us cancer, right? We should avoid it, it gives us wrinkles, it gives us cancer, it gives us spots on our skin. So we should avoid it. But the sun is actually what regulates in our bodies in response to it, much like a plant, right? Like a plant needs sun or it's gonna die. A plant needs needs the sunlight. Animals, if they're kept in the dark all the time, unless they're nocturnal animals, don't do well, they don't thrive. So living things need to be exposed to the sun in order to have the chemical processes that go on in their brains happen in a normal way so one of the things that we've done studies of not me there are <laughs> there are studies of people who work night shift and they yeah. don't ever see the sun and they work at night they sleep during the day they have less exposure to sunlight not even just not even just like being outside in the sun or sunbathing or any of that, just mm -hmm. the sun being up when you're up and awake, they tend to have higher levels of cancer, much higher levels of depression. They tend to have higher levels of many diseases because their body's chemical state is out of sync with how they're living their lives. So evolutionarily, and this is like the daylight savings time, yeah. thing, right? So evolutionarily, we were up when the sun was up, there wasn't any electricity, it got dark, we went to bed, and then we would wake up when the sun came up, we would do what we do during the day, and when it got dark, we can't do anything, there's no electricity, you go to bed. Yeah. Even if you go camping, and you don't have a lot of lanterns, and you're doing most of the things by the fire, it gets dark, you go to bed, right. you're done, and there's <laughs> Day's nothing over. else, Dave's over, and you go to bed, and then you wake up in your tent when the light comes up. Right. That's what, in a normal universe for our biological being, would have happened so we would be sleeping now for longer periods of time and working for very short periods of time and we don't right like we still go to work we go to work when it's dark and we get and we get home when it's dark and some of that causes chemical changes in what should be happening in our brain during that time just based on our biology yeah how normal is it for somebody to experience seasonal affective disorder so they say it has about a 20% incidence. I think that's probably under calling it, likely because we're not diagnosing it, or likely because people aren't identifying as having that, right? So in order to come up with an incidence, you have to actually find the condition, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to say people have this or people don't have this, people have to self-report as having it, or they have to have it identified by a provider. And I think often when somebody comes into the office, the providers think, okay, you have depression, here's an antidepressant, mm -hmm. and moving on. Right. Um, or go see a therapist, if it's not my issue. So the, those patients, sometimes I think providers don't put two and two together and don't say, well, gosh, it's November right. and you're feeling this and you don't feel it at any other time during the year. So that wouldn't necessarily get deemed seasonal affective disorder. It might get deemed depression when it's not actually depression. Um, it's very common, I think, more so among women. And I think likely because we have more risk factors for depressive disorders, we have hormones that fluctuate in ways that men's hormones don't fluctuate. We have a different set of demands. Mm -hmm. Even if we're not mothers, women have a different set of demands and expectations that are put on them than men do. Mm -hmm. And that's not being 
gender biased. It just is. It is. That's just how it is. <laughs> we have different cultural expectations of us, and I think it puts women at greater risk. We know there's a higher instance of it in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, we also know there's a really high instance of vitamin D deficiency, and vitamin D deficiency, we think of vitamin D as a vitamin because we call it a vitamin. Mm -hmm. It's not really in a lot of food, so it's right. not really like a nutrient that we get from food because most food does not have vitamin D in it and you have to eat some odd things in large quantities to get sufficient dietary vitamin D. That's why they started adding it to milk. Mm -hmm. like they put the vitamins A and D in the milk to try to prevent people from becoming deficient. But vitamin D is actually a hormone that we produce and really in response to sunlight. So the less that we're exposed to the sun, the less vitamin D we produce and we become imbalanced with that hormone. That hormone in turn regulates things like our thyroid, which regulates our metabolism, causes problems with our mood if it's out of whack. It regulates the hormones that are produced in our pituitary gland. It can regulate then or dysregulate what's happening in our ovaries as a yeah. result too. I saw on here, Brittany asked, is there any actual science behind happy lights that you know of? Is yeah. it actually beneficial? Yes, there's actually a huge body of research behind the happy lights. So the happy lights are kind of the thing that you can get. I think Philips makes one. There are a couple of medical happy lights that you can get. Um, you could get a prescription for them and have a durable medical equipment company give you one if you have the if you have an insurance company that covers such a device and if you have the appropriate uh, letters and numbers to call that condition what it is, um, you could potentially get one prescribed. And there is a significant body of literature that supports that. It does have to be used in a particular way, though. So a happy light is UV light. It is the light that the sun gets to you. And you have to expose yourself to it in a regular pattern over the course of the day in order to stimulate those hormones to get back into cycle. You can't just sit in front of the light and feel instantaneously better. You have to have regular exposure to it. It has to be during certain times of the day. So you can't just turn the light on and then go about your day and not be exposed to it. You actually have to be pretty close to it and your skin has to actively absorb that in order to improve your mood. But the happy lights do work. They are an effective treatment. They in in randomized trials where they've looked at they've looked at antidepressants. If we treat this depression with antidepressants, or if we treat this depression with a happy light, what happens? They're actually shown to be equivalent. And in some cases, because there are no side effects of the happy light, the happy light fares better for people or people who are using it fare better because they're not then having to deal with what's happening as a result of taking the medication, which may also include they feel better about a therapy that's not a pharmaceutical therapy. People have different responses to different kinds of therapies and what they're doing and feeling dependent on something. The happy light kind of takes that all away and is a non-invasive and non-harmful um, way of managing that. We know also that there are certain wavelengths of light that we're exposed to in the workplace mostly and in our homes like the light bulbs that we use are mostly blue light blue light is awesome for treating acne if it's right against your face blue light is not awesome for treating your mood um, if you're exposed to it all the time so blue light exposure is something that we have a lot more in this country and as we work in the winter we have to turn the lights off more in our houses and we're exposed to it more in the winter. So blue light we know has a negative impact on mood if you're exposed to it in a chronic fashion. Red wavelengths of light have a positive impact on mood and the UV light improves things because it improves the circadian pattern that's happening in your brain and improves what's being released from your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus. Also increases that vitamin D level a little bit, which red light does not do, but there's definitely a lot of science behind red light, blue light, and what it, how it can be a harmful, have a harmful effect on people's mood, um, and the wavelengths of light that we cannot actually see that also exist. So like the far and near infrared light, which is so far on the spectrum of light that we can't actually see it, those wavelengths of light also have potentially beneficial effects. <laughs> Yes, you should make it part of your routine, especially once daylight savings time hits and you're spending more time without that natural light and without that exposure. I would turn it on in the morning when you get up uh, around the time that the sun would normally be coming up and I would sit with it for 30 minutes 
and then I would do that again in the afternoon. And I can send you, if you like, a protocol, just direct messages. I can send you a protocol on how to use the Happy Life to improve your well-being or to improve the well-being of somebody else who you know is being affected by the seasonal change. So with that being said, I know in the office here we have the red light and the infrared light mm -hmm. that we <clears throat> and we have blue light, but it's right. We don't use it free, but that's for acne, and it does work incredibly well for that. <laughs> and we do encourage our patients to use it after their visit to help them mm -hmm. get some like, exposure. Um, but does anybody ever leave like bummed out by the light? No. People are like, yes. When well, they leave feeling like, oh my gosh, I feel so like rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, so we we try and get people to use the red light because mm -hmm. we know all the benefits of it um but when it comes to kind of treatment of the winter blues mm -hmm. and the seasonal affective disorder and some people don't like you said don't want to take the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. route or maybe they're only on it for a period of time since it's only happening a few months out of the year what are some like potential ways that women can help themselves through the winter blues that they're experiencing kind of maybe down both routes. Yeah, so there, I mean, we know that exercise increases the endorphins in the brain. Sorry, I just read her little. She likes the protocol. <laughs> oh. She likes the protocol and she's got a phone. <laughs> Yeah, so just direct messages, just send us a message and we will send you back the protocol for the use of the happy light, which is different from the use of the red light. It is, they're different lights and they're doing different things. Um, so things that people can do, which is what Sarah asked, things that people can do once they start experiencing the winter blues, not to prevent them, but to treat it once they've identified that that's something that's happening for them. Things that they can do are exercise, which increases the endorphins that circulate in your brain. Endorphins are what your body releases when you have an orgasm. It feels good. You feel good, you feel relaxed, you feel great, and um, it improves your mood. That's why people will be like, oh, I need to get laid. Like, they're crabby and then they have an orgasm, and then they feel better. But it's not the orgasm that made them feel better, it's the endorphins that are released in their brain and the hormones that are released in their brain in response to that activity. The same thing happens when we exercise. However, exercise isn't quite as fun as having sex. Like, it's easier to have sex. So you can go and have a bunch of orgasms, or you could exercise and increase the endorphins that are circulating in your brain, and that improves mood. We know that improves mood. That's hard to fit in. And of all of the things in this holiday season that we're going to work hard to do, we're going to bake cookies to give them to our friends and our neighbors and our family before we exercise. Yeah. So if you can fit into your life, exercise. And exercise should be a decently vigorous exercise where you're where you're um, getting your heart rate up, you're feeling kind of sweaty, you're not able to talk the way that you would typically talk, like you have to kind of take a pause and talk. It should be a decently vigorous exercise. That's required to get your endorphins increased by exercise. So that's one treatment. Um, certainly exposing yourself to light. So as a medical provider, I'm not supposed to recommend UV light because it's actually very bad for you. It does cause cancer. You should not use a tanning bed. However, in the winter, you can use a tanning bed. So in the winter, you can use a tanning bed for three minutes <laughs> only, not to get a tan. Well, not to get a tan and not for excessive exposure to UV light, like not to get brown, not to look sexy, just to have that momentary exposure because you will produce more vitamin D with exposure to that UV light in the tanning bed than you can take. Like it, with that three minutes of exposure, you will produce more of your natural synthesized vitamin D than anything you can consume. And you'll absorb more because you're making it yourself with your body than if we give you something to take to supplement your vitamin D. Um, so you can go tanning to increase your vitamin D production, remembering that vitamin D is a hormone, just for a few minutes, go tanning, and that will improve people's moods and does treat seasonal affective disorder. So you could do it, but I wouldn't do it every day, and I wouldn't do it um, for longer than three minutes at a time just because I don't want you guys to get skin cancer. And then the other things that people can do, you can take an antidepressant. So you could take something that increases the circulating serotonin in your brain, so something like an SSRI 
could cause you to have an elevated mood, so it could improve your mood and make you feel like you're a little bit more functional because you're coming out of that depressive stage. Um, but it's not necessarily something that you would need to use long term. So it's not necessarily something that you have to continue taking. And if you want to try stop stopping it in the springtime when the sun comes back out, you may find that your mood's actually considerably better and that you don't need it because what was happening was a temporary change in the circulating chemicals in your brain. Um, and then the other things that are potential treatments are using an infrared light, using the happy light, using the red light. Um, so using those wavelengths of light to combat the blue light that we're exposed to all day and to absorb that and improve your mood. And if you go on our website, www.chinjin.com, and you look at, we do a, an article every month. If you look at the most recent article in our Chin Chats section, um, the most recent article is actually about seasonal affective disorder or those winter blues and how the red light or infrared light can improve that. And it has the whole body of literature kind of synthesized down into a tiny little article. Um, but that's a great read if you're interested in finding out more about the red light yeah. and the infrared light and how it treats things. And sure. for Brittany, I will send her a protocol on how to use that happy light and use it in a way that's going to be effective. Yeah. So those are all some options. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I think I know the answer to this, but I also know that sometimes some of us just need to hear it, especially from a medical you provider. Don't want you to. I mean, okay, wait, hold on. <laughs> Pause. Yeah, so you could have you could have a Caribbean vacation or go to Hawaii too, and that would also do the same thing. Although you can't just go and live there. But if you want a snowbird, if you have if you have the means to become a snowbird, then that's generally what I would recommend to prevent and ultimately treat seasonal affective disorder. If you're finding that you have it, as many people do, they live in the summer up in the Pacific Northwest, and mm -hmm. then they'll travel somewhere that has more sunlight in the winter. You heard it, she told me I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs> but I, I I, think I know the answer to this, but I do think sometimes it helps for, for women to hear it, especially from a provider. Feeling guilty for feeling blue during the winter. Women should not feel guilty for feeling away during Oh, during the Christmas this season. season, during the season of Marian Bright and Bright, uh, <laughs> and all the holidays, and so festive, and I should feel awesome. That. <laughs> um, no, actually, lots of people feel really badly during the holiday season, and the holiday season actually brings up so many stressors that it can trigger people to feel incredibly anxious, especially if they have underlying anxiety, or it can trigger depression. And that stupid phone that you scroll through <laughs> with your Instagram on it that's showing you how well everybody else is doing and how like oh nice gosh, their house yeah. looks and their decorations, and you're like, oh, I don't even have a lights on um, my house and it's halfway through Christmas and the dog's stepping on them and they're still in my living room and I can't take a picture to put on Instagram because it's a mess. So I'll and just take a selfie. Are you ready for Christmas yet? Yes. Are you ready for Christmas yet? Oh, wait, what was I supposed to get? And the, there are all these sales and all the stuff that you have to buy. You can't go to the store and just get dinner food because you also have to get, like, then you're reminded, oh, I should be buying stuff for, maybe my neighbor's going to get me a present and then I have to get them a present. And there's a lot of guilt that's just generally triggered by the whole cultural experience of celebrating holidays, which is not to say that holidays are bad. Right. I love Christmas. I think it's fabulous. I love Thanksgiving. I think it's fabulous. But it is also an inherently stressful time for people. And in particular, I feel like social media makes it harder for people to navigate the holidays because the expectations just keep getting higher and higher. And then we feel like we have to do more and more and more mm -hmm. and get better and better and better. And it's an unattainable goal. Like yeah. it's not something that's ever going to happen for anybody, um, even those influencers. So I think that I think that it is kind of normal to feel crappy during the holidays and then to feel a little bit guilty about feeling crappy about it. And people start having all these holiday parties too that sometimes we don't want to go to because we're tired or we have something else to do or we wanted to watch TV and we feel obligated. So there's a lot of obligation. There's a lot of family obligation. There's a lot of friends obligation. There's a lot of like showing up to things that you don't really want to be at and trying to juggle it in with all of the other things that you're doing can generate a lot of guilt and a lot of feeling uh, inadequate, which can, even if you don't have seasonal affective disorder, cause a mood problem because you're feeling miserable about what's happening in your life. 
I think the other time when women might have do have difficulty at the holidays is if they've lost somebody close to them. If they've lost somebody close to them, even if it really doesn't have anything to do with the holidays, the holidays can be, so even if it happened at a time that wasn't associated with the holiday, often we spend time with the people we love the most during the holidays and you know we're on the phone talking to our families if they're far away or FaceTiming our families or um, somebody told me about something called a Marco, which I didn't know was a thing or like a Duo oh, the Marco Polo. Oh, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's like I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> there's something that you can do where you can see everybody, and if there's a person who's missing and there's a gap in that, then that can also trigger you know emotions of, related to grief. Or if you've lost a child or a parent or a sibling or somebody who's in that that unified space that you're supposed to be celebrating with during the holidays. If you've lost your spouse, if you've lost a good friend who you would typically contact, it can be a time that's really full of turmoil and a lot of emotional anguish to walk through like getting ready for it and yeah. pretend to be happy when really you're feeling this mixed bag of a lot of it yeah. feels bad because this person's not here anymore and excuse me, missing them. Yeah, totally, totally normal to feel. So sometimes feel bad at Christmas. Feel bad. Um, and I would just like to say, Tara, if you are in San Diego, when I am in San Diego, we're getting lunch or margaritas. Are there foods that can help elevate mood naturally? Foods high in vitamin D, mm, mushrooms. Crispy mushrooms from Costco or whatever they are. Yeah, but you have to eat a lot of them. I need that. Um, and foods that should be avoided because it makes the mood worse. So the comfort foods that you refer to, feel good in the moment. They're all the things that we want to eat at Christmas, right? They're all the things that we go to the Christmas parties and we eat them, we put them on our plates and we eat them. And then in January, we're going to feel guilty about eating them because we're going to have gained a bunch of weight. Um, but they're all the things that we feel like excited to have, right? Like they're the pies, they're the cakes, they're the cookies, they're the Christmas goodies that everybody's eating like everybody keeps bringing baskets of stuff to the office um that has different kinds of yummy things in it so everything that has sugar in it basically is going to give you a big boost of dopamine initially and you're going to feel really good about having eaten that thing and then typically what happens um, because of the chemical process in your body is later on you don't feel quite so good and you need a little bit more of it to feel better because you want that dopamine and everybody's brain is different right like I like sweet things, but not as much as Sarah's, like things. <laughs> because Sarah's brain has a different chemical composition than mine does, and her brain does something different in response to sugar than mine does. So I might feel fine if I eat something that's sweet, um, but I'll probably feel pretty happy that I had it because it tastes good, and then I'll, I might feel fine later because I don't have a big plummet in my dopamine, where Sarah might, and then she might feel like shit for the rest of the day, and then her mood might actually get worse over time, even though in the moment she felt like her mood was being elevated by the sugar that she was consuming. Um, so sugar is definitely something that can cause problems with mood if you have a brain that responds to sugar the way that Sarah's does which is that she feels great and then eventually doesn't feel so good and then has to have some more because it feels great. And then I blow up. And then, and then she also has the kind of body that gains weight in response to sugar, or I don't. She's like, who's that? Yes. Um, so, so sugar is something, it doesn't make vitamin D worse, but it does make mood worse. Vitamin D is really, 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 really hard to get from food because it's a hormone. It's not really a vitamin it's a hormone that we make in our bodies in response to things and it's synthesized mostly by sunlight. So there are high levels of vitamin D in some kind of odd things, mushrooms, um, liver, because that's where it's processed from animals. So eating animal liver can increase your vitamin D. Eggs have vitamin D in it. Um, and some shellfish have vitamin D in it, but there's not a lot of naturally occurring vitamin D and we don't actually absorb it very well dietarily. So if we ingest it, it's not very well absorbed. And if we are ingesting it, like for instance, as a supplement, or if we're trying to get most of our vitamin D from something like mushrooms, we should saute them in butter because it's a fat soluble vitamin. And if it's not in something that has fat in it, or if it's not taken with something that has fat in it, it doesn't really get into your bloodstream the right way and you just pee it out. 
Um, so it gets excreted from your body and you metabolize it and then it's not really available for you to use or increase your own vitamin D. It's really better to make your own vitamin D. And like I said, UV light is not the red light, not the infrared light, not the blue light, to some extent the happy light, but you have to be exposed to it for a decent amount of time because it's not very high levels of UV light. That tanning bed will increase your vitamin D. Hawaii will increase your vitamin D but you want to make sure you're also protecting your skin. So if you're in Hawaii for long periods of time, I would say wear an SPF because like, like Epion's or, <laughs> or another 50 plus SPF because you do want to protect your skin. You want to protect your skin from damage to the sun. But I would spend a few minutes, like I said, three sufficient, a few minutes being completely SPF free and exposed to the sun, you're gonna make great amounts of vitamin D. The same is true for a tanning bed because it simulates exactly the same kind of light that the sun produces and causes that synthesis. Just like a plant turns green in response to the sun, we make vitamin D in response to the sun. Our poor little plant outside is- I know, it wants some sun. That plant has seasonal effect in this <laughs> Other questions? We're about to get ready to go see our afternoon patients. Any questions that come up or any other things that arise that people want more information about, like Brittany wants a protocol for the use of that light. Um, anybody who wants to try the red light, come by. Liz loves it. She thinks it's fantastic. I have not yet met anybody who doesn't think it's fantastic. For some people, it is a little bright. And if that's the case, we can always give you goggles to decrease the brightness. However, the red light will never damage your eyes despite being bright because it's not UV light and it's not penetrating that retina in a way that's problematic. So you don't need to wear goggles. Some people enjoy standing in front of it. It's a great place to take a selfie. It looks really cool. <laughs> if you haven't seen a selfie, go to our Instagram. Great. So the red light, the infrared light, they're both here. We have blue light for acne, doesn't do anything for your mood, actually could harm your mood if you're using it all the time, but we don't use it all the time. We just use it to treat the acne. Um, those are available here. We don't have a tanning bed. You have to go to the, is blue light bad for melasma? No, but it won't do anything for it. It's not gonna make it bad, it's not gonna make it better. Um, the red light might make it a little bit better because of how the red light affects your skin, but it will not make it go away entirely. Yeah. Oh, we do have treatment. You gotta, you gotta have that laser off, Sarah. Got some good lasers. You can treat that too. Treat it all. So, anyway, questions about moon. Other questions, Sarah, send me a direct message about your melasma. Um, other questions that arise. If you watch this later and you didn't have the opportunity to ask us questions, send us a message. We will happily answer your questions. Come into the clinic. We will happily show you the red light, put you in front of it, make you feel good. And uh, have a good Friday. Happy Friday. Friday. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I kept thinking you might be there.